the record button. Great, thank you. All right. Um, are there any amendments to the agenda? Okay. Um, hearing none, is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Ben? I need a second? Second. <laughs> second from Josh. I'm saying your names because Raina has to write that stuff down. All right. Um, is there any um, public comment at this time? Okay, seeing none, we'll have another time for that at the end of the meeting. And we'll go right into the reports. Sherry's report is in the um, board book. So um, if you haven't had a chance yet to read it, go ahead and read it. And um, if you have any questions for her, she's away until tomorrow, I believe. And then she'll be back. Oh, okay. All right. And... There's a report from the Director of Technology. And again, it's in the board book. I don't see Raf on, but it sounds like he's had a good summer getting the new networks set up and has hired a new person to be an IT specialist. Oh, good. Yep. Great. And Shana, would you like to say anything about your report? Sure. Um, good evening. I always like to highlight a few things other than what I bullet in the report. And the things that I wanted to focus on this evening, uh, you know, we're in a very crunch type of season for staffing, you know, both in our area and across the state with um, uh, staffing shortages. So I've spent a lot of time this summer actively recruiting good staff, looking through databases, making personal connections, but also focusing on investment in the staff that we have so that we have staff retention. And that investment is through building staff expertise and value and the experiences that they have as professional educators. One example of that has to do with onboarding, which is something that we've always done uh, in our district, and we also have a mentoring program for new employees, which is really amazing. But for onboarding, we wanted to take it to the next level. And Amanda Rank and I have been working to provide or plan both long and short term onboarding to provide beyond just what you need for a new employee in our district, uh, in the special education team, uh, you know, to get started. But really, like we do for students, meet the special education uh, team member where they are and differentiate our onboarding and support of that staff member uh, throughout the year rather than just getting started. Uh, one of the other things that's been a big uh, project this summer is working on the MTSS or multiple tiers of student support uh, systems. And we've decided that we're calling it multiple tiers of student success instead of just support so we can focus on prevention uh, rather than just intervention and we can build the skills of all of our students. You've also heard us talking about or referring to the new rules in Vermont for special education. And I just wanted to you know, give a highlight about what that means. And previously in Vermont, you had to wait until a, a pretty strenuous point uh, for a student to have an extremely low level of proficiency to be able to qualify for special education services. When the law changed on July 1st, it changed the focus again to this prevention model to be able for, uh, for us to be able to use special education dollars, not just for students who had already uh, been qualified for special education, but to focus attention on the prevention and the intervention to hopefully prevent students from reaching the point where they might need those extra services. And we will be spending two full days with a leading expert in the state of Vermont coming to our district and working with our special educators to fully understand and implement um, those new uh, laws and rule changes. Thank you. That sounds like really good common sense to change the focus of that. So thank you, Shana. Um, I don't think we have Jen tonight either, but she has a report as well. Um, highlighting summer trainings and different 
summer work that's been going on with the leadership team and the uh, continuous improvement team and other groups reviewing the portrait of, of a graduate. So I'm sure in the fall, she'll have more to say about that um, and where that's going. Um, there's quite a lot of information in there. All right, I think, and then Jim, do you have a report? I, I didn't submit a report. Um, it's our busiest time of the year as we roll the budget and um, set up payroll for next year and close the prior fiscal year. All of my state reports are due by Monday the 15th. So um, that's high in, high priority in my agenda this week and we're getting there. Um, as I have two new staff members in my department, it's also training so they know how to help me get there. So it's a, it's a busy season. Mm -hmm. um, things are going well with the new software and um, yeah. Good, thanks. Well, I know you're going to speak further on in the meeting, so. Lots of other things going on also, yeah. yes. <laughs> All right, so at this time, um, can you pull up the strategic plan, Jim? Um, Sherry has asked us to take a look at the strategic plan goals, and Marianne, you were on a group that worked on that. I was for the portrait of the graduate. Oh, okay. Sorry, I just said the wrong thing. Oh, that's all right. I wouldn't mind hearing from you on yeah, that afterwards. Yeah. These are strategic plan goals for 23, 24. And each year we um, bring forward certain strategies and goals and assign tasks for, um, to, uh, for the people who will be working on achieving these goals. So the first area that uh, we're focusing on is students, student success. And strategies out of a strategic plan are 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1.5, and 2.1. Uh, design, implement, you know, task and capstone projects. And, um, and, and it goes into some detail, but that's right out of a strategic plan. And the project managers for that will be Jen, the high school principal, the Killington Elementary Principal and the Prosser Valley Principal. Uh, strategic plan uh, strategy 1.2 is achieve high levels of math proficiency. And Sherry and Shana will be the project managers on that. Um, strategy 1.4 review, refine, and when necessary, establish stewardship experiences. This is a crosswalk with EL curriculum and identifies gaps. And again, the three project managers are you know, three of our principals. Um, design and implement a K-12 digital citizenship curriculum, director of technology and the middle school, high school principal. Provide opportunities in the middle school that immerse students in authentic experiences that lead to greater understanding of future possibilities. Again, these are right out of the strategic plan. And that's the middle school principal, the superintendent and director of curriculum. Ensure that all students beginning their junior year identify at least two viable pathways for post-secondary ed. Um, again, another strategy, high school assistant principal, um, Cody Tancredi will be doing that. Um, learning environment, uh, remediate the facilities the deficiencies. Um, you guys all know who's involved in that one. <laughs> Um, you know, that's certainly one that Ben is um, instrumental in, but Carrie's involved, I'm involved, Sherry's involved, and it's just a number of you. Um, community Alliance, growth, growth Center Community Connections, and create a system to recruit, maintain, and train community partners. Again, uh, Cody Tancredi is taking the um, lead on that. Uh, strategy for culture, develop a structure within the schools that provides opportunity for student leadership. And um, the West leadership and Barnard principal are focusing on, on that. Foundational systems, um, view and revise uh, human resource protocols, um, staff handbook, job description, supervision, and evaluation process, and a team including Maggie, myself, uh, Linda, 
Lopret and and Radford and and Raina are working on that one and establish an endowment uh, foundation to simplify and encourage donations to the district. Um, um, that's been assigned to the board chair, the vice chair, so Carrie, Ben, me, and Sherry. And those are the goals that we are um, and what we're focusing on for the next year. And this is the fifth year of the five-year plan, so I'm sure that at some point during this year we're going to be doing um, another review of all of those things and yeah. crossing off the ones that have been accomplished. I know Sherry has shown us the chart. If you recall, that says where it's just beginning, it's in process, or it's um, completed. So um, something that she brings to us two or three times in a year. So. All right, thank you, Jim, for your help with that. Uh, Carrie? Yes. Um, I'm not sure if Jim was sharing his screen. I couldn't see the document he was reading from, and I didn't see a link in the agenda. Is it possible just to share a, a link to the document that had those? Yes, I think uh, that, I thought there, no, no, there isn't. Sorry. Yes, I can, uh, we'll get that to everybody. I apologize for not sharing my screen. I, no I problem. Um. All right. Any questions on the um, or comments on the strategic plan and the goals? We need a vote on those. No, we don't need a vote. Okay. Um, but the next thing that we do have, um, which uh, Jim can probably share, is the board work plan, which is linked in the uh, board book. So we're just reviewing here or have giving everyone an opportunity to take a look at um, the work plan. And this is when uh, Ben, Sherry, and I set agendas. Uh, it's we look and see, okay, what's coming up, what needs, what reports do we think the board members would like to hear on the education side of things, on the technical sort of, sort of things. So that's why each month we have various reports being made to all of us. And um, in August, you can see there's a work plan. Um, so there's some places where we have some light meetings and we'll be putting more things in as the year goes on. But if any board members have a request for any information, and that's when sometimes people have talked about, I recall that um, looking at the data of um, discipline for boys versus girls. And so that there will be a report. Um, I know Raf has been crunching data on that. Um, but they're designed to inform us and keep us up to date on uh, what we should know in case people stop us on the street and say, hey, what about that X, Y, Z? Um, so you can see along the way that um, in this month where we've got um, some things coming up on the logo and the construction managers and the fee cards. And then in September, we'll be approving a construction manager etc. So um, Ralph will be giving um, a data presentation on the demographics, which kind of has to wait until November because of the way that the state makes the count in October. It's after our October meeting and so forth. And then December, January and are very heavy on the budget. Um, and when we get into February, we're kind of ending the, the, the board year as we get ready for town meeting time. So I'm sure there will be some other things put in around the um, Australian ballot and uh, presentations and setting up things for the community. And then April, May, and June is um, finishing off the school year. So, so that work plan is something that um, we all check once a month or so with Sherry when we meet with Sherry. But if there are things you would like to know more about, that's a great time to let us know that anytime and then we can plan ahead so that we don't have too many reports i saw laura laughing over there stacked up in any one meeting we had one of those meetings i recall i think it was in may 
and maybe June too. Um, there a time where we're not going to be doing remote, any remote option? Is there a time that we're mandated to not do any remote option? Or? I don't think so. Okay. I think the state has kind of said this is it. This is the way it is. Okay. Good. Yeah, I think maybe they said that through twenty four, and then they're going to review it again. But Karen, Karen has her hand up. Corinne. Hi. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm wondering, Carrie, um, something that you mentioned in a recent email, and I'm wondering sort of where it is or ought to be on the calendar about our review of the superintendent. And I don't know if that's something that's, you know, if it's in executive session, if it would not be on this calendar, but oh, is that a yearly timely. thing? No, it's very timely because Ben and I, um, with input from a couple of other people, uh, are actually putting it together right now in a draft form of a survey so that we're going to go over it together. And um, we've got um, some community members who offered us some questions as well. And so we expect to get that out to you to be completed sometime this month. And then okay. what we would do is have it, we would probably discuss the data in executive session. Right. Is that something, is that a yearly review? And is it something that should be reflected on this calendar then to put it again on the calendar for next it sh you know, August it should or September? Be. Okay. Yes, it should be. I guess it's just which time of year is best to be doing that, whether that would be better done in May or, right. or in the fall. It doesn't, you know, so if anyone has input on that, that would be helpful to us. Yeah. I mean, I know things in the spring get that are busy, but it does seem like a you know sort of year end uh, wrap up is it, things are it might be a better time just in terms of you know you sort of have the year behind you and good time to do a review before you move off into your summer. But that's just yeah. my thought. Okay, well, thank you. Yes, thanks for bringing it up. Any other questions, thoughts? All right. Well, this must be the fastest meeting we've ever had. Um, could be. All right. The next thing um, is an opportunity to look at the logos. So again, <laughs> Jim's getting a Zoom workout. <laughs> I am. It's good for you. It is. <laughs> but you than me. So uh, thanks to um, Bob Crane and Rena and Bob's um, coworker, um, they have put together some uh, various views of mountain views. And um, Bob or Rena, would you like to speak to these? Uh, what, whether they're for various purposes or you want us to vote for one specific one? Um, I actually think that Bob, it would be nice if Bob could acknowledge um, the gentleman that he had work on these. These are, in my opinion, absolutely amazing, way beyond what anything I could have produced. And I am so grateful to Bob for arranging uh, to have this done. Yeah. Okay, All right, Bob, that's... would you like to speak? Yeah. Thanks, Raina. I will pass that along to Greg. Greg is a very talented uh, graphic designer. He's been in this business doing the like work for advanced animations for years and years and years. So I was pretty confident he'd come up with something we could choose from. Probably the biggest decisions need to be whether we favor a single type or a combination of, of, of types of logos. They're very similar, but for example, the top one the long skinny one might be used as masthead on letterhead, for example. Whereas the, the square ones, such as uh, Raina is using for her, her icon there, um, might be over to the upper left-hand corner of a page with, with text and whatnot to the right, the name, address of the school or the union or the high school uh, with contact information, et cetera, or some combination of those. If it's some combination, we need to know which ones of the ones here 
you know, whether it be like, yes, say the top one and the lower right one or pick two that are, are similar enough. I don't think they want to be much different than each other. But then beyond that, it's nuts and bolts of choosing whether or not you wish uh, Greg to proceed to create versions for each school and the union. I mean, there's the uh, supervisory union versus the school district versus the high school, the elementary schools, et cetera, and what formats they need to be in and whether or not you wanna subsequently be able to edit the information on anyone. So there you go. So some of these you'll see have all the schools named. Others uh, like the, that long skinny one that says Mountain View School District is just Woodstock Union High School with that contact information. So there's a lot of possibilities. You just need to decide what you want. Elliot. Yeah, so first of all, they look great. Thank you for facilitating this. I just have a question as to how they reproduce in black and white since, or, or any or any of them better or worse for black and white since, you know, they can be like this, but if many of us just print out things on a regular printer without a color printer, what will they look like? That's a great question. I printed some by accident in black and white and the, the mountains show up as different colors of grayscale, but it's been a while since I did it. Raina, have you tried that? Um, I have not tried it in black and white. Yeah, I think we should test various ones. Because maybe the bottom green part does or doesn't. I don't know, you know, the, um, the writing. We could certainly get that done and make sure that they do read properly yeah. in black and white. Good, good input. Any other strong opinions, questions? Do we have to use supervisory union specifically or could we just say school district? Down, down here. I see he, it on the bottom, yeah. He has the same logo yeah. with school district. Yeah. They're, so, they're two different um, things is my understanding. Yeah. They're yeah. two different. One, one includes Ray and the other doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Supervisory union includes Ray Pittsfield oh, as a part of it. Yeah, school. Mm -hmm. But the district is the school itself, not the towns per se. I'm not qualified to make decisions like this. I have to take myself out of it, but I love them all. I think they're beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest maybe um, Bob and Raina move forward and test out the black and white option and see which is best. And I, I feel like they're qualified to make the decision. They both are in that world. Yeah. Okay. If there's Good. another person from the board who'd like to be part of a small committee there to informally just make the pick in the logistics of it, is there anyone else who would like to weigh in? Good. Is it possible to add like 15 out of state or cars in the picture somewhere? <laughs> Modern times. Well, that seems like as good a time as any to, um, to mention my uh, um, slogan idea, right? Because oftentimes out of staters, this is kind of a, I don't know, a little bit of New England folklore. New Yorker comes up in New England and they're looking for directions to Penobscot or whatever, and they run into the old Vermont farmer who says, hey, you can't get there from here, right? Which is kind of a joke. But we could rip off of that and say, you know, Mountain Views uh, School District get there from here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's pretty yeah, that's good. That's that's good. good. <laughs> anyway, could be it could be incorporated into a you know logo or not. We like that. Well, one one, like one, one suggestion would yeah. be to it would be a little more work, but we we could talk to Greg to create. Uh, formats of, say, the top logo, one long logo and one square logo that are similar in nature, but give you guys a file whose text could be edited. Then you could put anything you want in there. Anywhere. Like where the, 
in the green bar at the bottom where where one version has the schools listed, one version has, say, supervisory union, one version has a single high, this high school, for example, uh, you could put a catchphrase in there. You'd have to come up with it. And I, I guess we'd all have to agree that it makes sense to associate it with the district. But if you had an editable file, you'd you'd be free down the road to do whatever you want. That's a great idea. Brianna, what do you think about that? I think that is within my skill set. <laughs> I can edit pre-made logos. <laughs> yeah, you just have to decide on the file format and after offline we could pass back and forth what the options are and what would be the most convenient for you depending on what yeah, software just, you use. Just stay with the same font and you know that you're gonna do capitals or all caps. Right? Yeah. Rand, do you have like pressing business for using logos, like something that needs to get printed up soon or? Um, we had a couple of requests from people for logos. Um, I do need separate logos for the school district and the supervisory union because there are times when we do business of one or the right. other. Um, I mean, it would be nice to get this wrapped up soon because we are searching for things to use. And I used to, the idea being that while we recognize that this is kind of a, a work in progress, we could authorize the administration to use any logo that's on the sheet for now since they're all pretty good. Would, would that be workable, do you think? That'd be fine for me. Yeah. Okay, I'll make that motion. I'll second. All right. Any further Matt's had his hand up. I was I, just I gonna. Have, I can't see it. Uh, no. Sorry. Thank you. I was just gonna ask if it would be helpful tonight for you to take a um, maybe non-binding vote, but just like it seems like there's two basic designs. One has the would appear to be more deciduous trees and the other one has the evergreens and the one with the deciduous trees has the light green grass on the bottom. So, so sort of like two distinct, um, are, are you suggesting Ben that like either of those would be the logo? Yes. Or do we... Yeah, I mean, depending then you just leave it to the administration to, if they've got, you know, if it's letterhead, they could use a big banner. If it's a t-shirt, they could use a square, right? Depending on the use, they're free to use those kind of approved logos. I like that idea. If that if that was a motion that was made, I, I'll second that. All right, um, are we ready to vote? Any further discussion? All right, sounds like we're ready to vote. All those in favor, say aye. Uh, aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, well, great work. Um, they're really beautiful. I pulled them up today to look at them and I was like, I couldn't make a decision here. So we'll let Bob and Raina wrestle with it, and get it, get it done, check it out and get it done as quickly as it's possible to get done. So Raina doesn't have to worry about this anymore. <laughs> Thank you, Raina um, and Bob. Okay. All right. At this time, well, we're going to be talking about the three qualified construction managers. And Ben, I believe you are going to speak to that. Oh, sure. I'm happy to. Um, so the process, just to kind of rewind to the, the new build construction manager selection process, one of the things that we were concerned about going into the selection was that under Vermont law, um, you're obligated to take the lowest bid, right, in response to an RF. Uh, RFP, right? Mm -hmm. So you need to be careful about, it's the lowest qualified bid. So you need to be really careful about um, what your qualifications are. Um, working, uh, Jim, kind of uh, working with some materials that we uh, looked at from uh, Burlington's construction project, came up with an approach to say, okay, well, let's first put out a request for qualifications. We'll send that to a number of firms. And Jim, I'll turn it over to you uh, in a second here to kind of speak to how that has gone. Um, and then, you know, based on the responses that we get from that process, 
we can put out our RFP based on the qualifications that we're seeing. So the purpose of this agenda item is um, to choose which firms we're going to send the RFP to based on what we've gotten in response to the RFQ. All right, so Jim, do you wanna speak about the RFQ process? Sure. We put the RFQ out publicly in newspapers on our website. I mailed it, emailed it directly to six construction companies. So I emailed it directly to PC Construction, to Engelbert Construction, to North Branch Construction, to Trumbull Nelson Construction, to DEW Construction, and to uh, Whitey Turner Construction. So six substantial companies that all do this type of work. Um, five of them responded. One of them did not even acknowledge it. Um, two of them, Trump Nelson said that the jar was large enough that they could not, they weren't willing to tie up their line of credit because it, part of it requires a hundred thousand dollar bond. I mean, a million dollar bond, a hundred million dollar yeah. bond. And they weren't willing to tie up that capacity. Um, North Branch out of Con Concord, New Hampshire, said that they have a three-year backlog of work and could not take on a project of this size with the work that they have. Um, PC Construction, uh, DEW, and Y.E. Turner all sent in about 100-page um, proposals or, or dis displays of their qualifications. Now, keep in mind, this is a construction manager. And um, just to make sure people understand, a construction manager isn't the contractor. What they do is they run the project, they put the, the components of the project out to bid, they hire the subcontractors, and along with the construction manager, we'll have an owner's rep that is on our payroll that works with a construction manager, represents us as a district in these conversations. And also we will have a small group of board, community, community and um, employees that will be on a project uh, committee that will meet with the construction manager and the owner's rep regularly, initially weekly, and then it will fall to probably bi-weekly to monthly at the end to review progress, to review bids, to um, bring bids back to the board for recommending to the board, and to review any change orders and bring those back to the proper people to make decisions. And so, although the construction manager may have a division, for instance, that does cabinet work and their, their division may bid on the cabinetry, they're one of multiple bidders and Vermont law requires us to have at least three bids. And so they would be bidding against other um, subcontractors. And so that's generally the process. Construction manager gets paid a fee, and the manager may be a team, but it's usually a, a very shallow team of three to five people who are here running our project. And so um, Jim and Joe have reviewed in depth in detail the, the three substantive proposals, the ones that are like 80 to 100 pages. We said that was um, DEW, PC Construction, White and Turner. And in, in Joe's words, they're all players, right? They all kind of, you know, brought something uh, considerable experience and qualifications to the table. And in speaking with Jim, the recommendation they're making is that we uh, send those three firms the request for proposal. Joe and I have worked with two of those three firms. The only firm we haven't worked with is Elaine Turner, and they're they're probably the largest of the three firms. Yeah, and Wayne Turner is doing the Burlington project currently, and they also did our costing two years ago. And, and DEW, I believe, did the um, the Woodstock uh, Safety Center. Hmm. Yes. Last year. So I guess we would need a, do you want to? Yeah, we need a motion um, to approve your request. To send the RFP to, is that the right word? RFP, okay. Yeah, oh, here's the madness. Um, to the three uh, firms that you have recommended. So, is there a motion to approve the request? So moved. Is there a second? Sorry. Right. Lara second. Um, is there any other other questions? I think Corinne had a hand. 
No, just was going to second. Oh, oh okay. Mm -hmm. I know Matt had some questions um, kind of before the meeting. Matt, did you get your questions answered on this? Um, I did. Thank you. Okay. So now the project manager, do we have to take the cheapest bid of the three? Yes. Was the project manager? Yeah, yeah. for these three. That's qualified. Yeah. 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 I mean, we could make a determination when they answer the RFP that, that they're not qualified, yeah. right? Depending on what they send us back. Yeah. But that would be that. We have to take the lowest qualified bid. So if there's a reason to disqualify yeah. one, um, then we can go with a second. But if they challenge it, it's got to stand up. Mm -hmm. I don't see why you would want to take the lowest qualified bid anyway. Mm -hmm. Lowest qualified. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you can you clarify in this? So these three will receive our RFP. Will they be proposing back a, a, a price to build the new building or would they just be proposing back their fee to act as construction manager? When we say we have to take the lowest price, are we talking about the lowest price for the total building cost or are we just talking about their fee as a construction manager? Okay, so we're structuring it that it's fees for their their services for construction manager and we're breaking the fees into uh pre-approval and post-approval so there'll be uh prior to the march vote and then when we pass it in march then their second uh portion of it so they'll work with us developing the cost with the architect uh to present to the voters this winter and then when that passes in March, then they take over and run the project for us. And so it's just their fee. It has, at this point, it has nothing to do with the actual uh, guaranteed price or anything else on the building. Okay, there thank you. There could be some apples and oranges we need to sort out there, right, Jim? I think we talked about how some may propose a percentage of the total project cost, some may propose a flat fee, and we need to be able to compare those for purposes of selection. My experience has been that the fee is generally based on a percentage of the project. Um, that said, um, every time I've had a fee presented that way, then we've gone back and negotiated with them to lock in a fee and then give them a percentage on any change orders. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that we lock in, this is what, the, what it's gonna cost us to build the building. Any change order, you'll get X percent of it. And so if when we go to bid, the building goes up $5 million, they don't gain any more. It goes down $5 million, they've locked in their, their cost or their, their income. Okay. So it's going to take 18 to 24 months, regardless of what the building costs. If we decide that the lowest bidder is disqualified for some reason that wasn't in their 100 pages of how great they are, um, does the state then require us to, to send out an RFP to a third company so that we have three at all times? Yeah. Okay, so that's just... We just better be really good if we're going to be disqualifying one that we have a solid reason. Okay, any further questions? Well, aren't we voting tonight to determine that these three are qualified? Isn't that tonight's vote? Yes. Yes. Okay, are we ready to vote? All those in favor of um, recommending, uh, approving the recommendation, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. You've got your work cut out for you. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, uh, Ben and Jim. The next thing um, is Jim has a, 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 a 24th century, 21st century <laughs> process for eliminating the purchase order, which is the bane of every person who has to use it. So these are, this, this got me quite excited reading it. Tells you something about my life right now. <laughs> Well, it does feel like it's the 24th century because apparently the way to streamline our process is to send it to a bank in another country right and then and that's better than what we've been doing. <laughs> it is well, yeah. yeah. 
So a procurement card functions similar to a purchase order, I mean, to a credit card. Um, about 15 years ago, Illinois ASBO, which is the Association of School Business Officials, um, created with a bank, the Bank of Ohio, a procurement card for Illinois. The Bank of Ohio then merged with the Bank of Montreal, and that's why it's a Canadian bank now. Mm. Um, so that's a little of the history, because I started when it was Bank of Ohio, and, and uh, they speak both English and French at, at the bank now, and it's, it's, it's a great bank. Um, so one of the things, and what you may not know is this myth about more papers, better paper trail. Um, Julie Stevens, who's our accounts payable clerk, has a wall of file cabinets. And by June 30th, half of them will be empty and we'll be giving them away. By June 30th, a year from now, uh, two years from now, she'll have one file cabinet because all of her paperwork is being scanned online and attached to the activity in our software. So we're going away from paper. We have a storage room that's a third the size of this build of this room that's just storage for business office paper. And it will get down to three or four cabinets. Um, what's actually cost to process a purchase order? It costs, it costs a lot. If you've ever tried to follow a requisition from a teacher all the way through the process to a purchase order, and then you get it paid, and Carrie's laughing because she's a teacher or has been a teacher and knows the process, it's a cumbersome process. It takes not minutes, but days and weeks sometimes, and it's, it's an awful process. This expedites it. Okay, currently, a teacher prepares some sort of requisition, and often it's paper. Many times it's an online form in each building. It's approved by its principal, goes to whoever processes the purchase order. That's all being done now in the buildings. Then it gets purchased, we receive it, and it goes to accounts payable. And you can see from this screen all the things that we eliminate as part of the process. Hmm. We will not eliminate this process, but we'll reduce our dependence on this process. The average cost of processing a purchase order manually $75 to $200. We're probably in the $5 to $20 a purchase order. We're not in this average price, but it's not, it's not inexpensive when you think about how many people have to handle it before it becomes a purchase order. And so my guess is that we can reduce our costs by 50% on just that process. We do about 3,000 purchase orders a year. Okay. These numbers here from 2001 to 2006, that's a real reduction that we will see. We will never eliminate them, but that's a real reduction that we'll see. What well, is important, and this is old information, is reduction of checks being written. I want you to know that we've already, since I've been here, reduced the number of checks we write by 40%. We send out many payments ACH. And so we send electronic payments. So we're not using paper, we're not using stamps, we're not using envelopes, we're not stuffing them. Um, and it's really quick, uh, it's really good. Lista, who's our treasurer, we've driven her batty because she's had to raise our ACH level four or five times because we keep spending more money electronically instead of on paper. So if we run a check run of 75 checks on Friday, 40 of them will be ACH now. And so that's substantial. So we've already cut our number of checks by 40%. This will cut it more because we'll close the account with a local hardware store and a lot of other places use our procurement cards and have one payment go out to five, you know, in lieu of five checks to, um, the procurement card. What's interesting, and I looked at this one because this one um, was curious to me, the percentage of checks that are less than $500. If we run 50 checks on Friday, 
30 of them will be under $1,000, and probably 20 of them will be under $500. You know, we, we run a big check to VisBit, our health insurance, for a couple hundred thousand dollars every month. But most of the checks are reimbursing me for mileage or paying for you know, um, a book or something like that. We're not writing big checks. We're writing one of the small ones. And so they're saying 55, 60% of AP checks are less than $500. Um, I don't think our percentage is quite that high, but it's very similar. And we could consolidate a lot, I won't say all, into a one payment every month. So we save a lot of the costs. <clears throat> one of the things with the procurement card is we don't have petty cash anymore. That's a thing of the past. Um, but the procurement card allows us to have more people have a credit card type of structure with little limits. I could put a $200 limit on a card. And so we can give somebody power to buy small things uh, without giving them enough power to you know, bankrupt the district. And so we can, we can set limits uh, quickly and, and use them well. Uh, some of the uh, beauties of this organization is that you know we experienced something last, last year with Sherry's on the West Coast and it maxed out her company credit card. And we had to do something so she could finish paying for the trip. And we did. But with this, I could log in and in five seconds, raise her limit for the week. And keep in mind that a limit has to be for a 60 day window because you have the month you buy it in and then 30 days before you pay it. So it's a two month window. But I could go in and raise her limit and within an hour she could use the new limit while she was traveling. So it, it makes it uh, easier for things like that. Okay. Yeah, we just continue the way we're going. This is innovative. Um, it's it's uh, one of the things with the, the procurement card. Um, it doesn't eliminate all purchase orders, but it certainly eliminates all, a lot of the small ones. It doesn't change what you buy. It doesn't change who you buy it from. It doesn't change when you buy. But Carrie and I were talking earlier, and it may change when you buy, because when she was teaching, uh, there would be an opportunity to buy something that was on a quick sale. By the time she could get a purchase order, the sale was over. So she may be able to take advantage of sales and save us, save us money, and other teachers can do the same thing. So it may change when you buy, because you may be able to take advantage of opportunities you couldn't. So they, they look like and they function like a credit card. Uh, they don't carry uh, a revolving line of credit. We establish a line of credit and um, monitor it. Uh, transaction limits per charge. We can do monthly limits. Uh, we can do preferred supplier restrictions. We can monitor 24 seven. I had, when I was at Fall Mountain, I had somebody's card get compromised. I was able to disable the card within minutes of learning that was compromised. And in a matter of an hour, had a new card issued and had the three questionable charges addressed. And so it wasn't difficult. And um, if you ever had a credit card compromise, you know the steps you go through. Um, when you have 30 of them out there, it's important to monitor and keep track. And somebody in this office would be monitoring the credit card activity almost daily and looking at things that don't appear right and making phone calls to employees if it's necessary. Uh, there's monthly bills, monthly bill recon reconciliation. Um, one of the things that I like to do is I, I want the school district names on the card, but I want the cards assigned. I don't want, for instance, the English department to have a card. I want somebody with a name on it at the card. So ownership or responsibility for the receipts and for the card are clearly defined. Uh, one of the things that comes in the package from them is 
um, a uh, document that everybody who gets a card signs, it really states what their responsibilities are as an employee of our district with that card. So I would not do the department, I would just do the individual name as an employee. There's no set of fees, there's no annual fees, there's no monthly fees, no online fees, no card cancellation fees, no, no fees to issue initial or replacement cards. There's a rebate. I want to tell you, Fall Mountain during COVID, and I took my credit limit on my card, which was $5,000, and I was at Fall Mountain, made it $150,000 for two months during COVID, and I bought a lot of stuff because we needed air filtration, we needed masks, we needed cleaning, we needed a lot of those things, and I took that on with the um, different department heads, but I put it all on my card, and we ended up getting a $10,000 check rebate back at the end of the year because I put all that on my credit card. Once I was done purchasing, we paid it off. I dropped my limit back to 5,000 because I didn't want that type of limit, but I needed it for a period of a couple months. And it was, it was, it really worked well for us. Um, there's a lot of fraud protection. It's locally administered. It's administered here. We have a person who's a full-time employee of Illinois ASBO, who's our contact. And then we have a person at the bank who's our contact. And the monthly billing is a consolidated statement. It comes here. Uh, people submit their receipts to us. One of the things that uh, we will do is we will not have late fees because what we will do is automatically pay them on the 25th of every month. Even if we are waiting for a receipt from somebody, we'll pay them and we'll fight with our employee for the receipt so that we don't pay late fees. And if there's, and I've had an issue where we paid something and found out later that it should, we shouldn't have paid it. They worked really well with me, you know, straightening out. So it wasn't an issue. They use MasterCard as their third party administrator of the program. Are there any questions? Bob, you've got your hand up. Go ahead, Bob. Oh, you're on mute. You're on mute. There we go. So there's no fees for anything, but I always learned when I was a kid that there's no such thing as a free lunch. Is the only way the company that does this makes money through the sometimes additional cost vendors charge if you use credit cards, such as MasterCard? Who's making the money and where's it coming from? Um, the, the way I believe it works, Bob, and if you've traveled a lot and use a credit card where you get an airplane mileage or something like that, it's the same idea. There's MasterCard charges a transaction fee, and part of that transaction fee goes to from um, Illinois ASBO. Some of it comes back to us. Some of it remains with the bank, and that's how how it all how it all works for us. But you don't anticipate the cost of the stuff we buy is going to incrementally be uh, raised because we're buying with a credit card or it's I more like a debit so. card than anything else. I don't believe so. There are companies that will give you a cash price and a credit card price, and those don't go away. Um, but um, and on the whole, um, it doesn't, it won't impact us. And for instance, we're buying more and more things through Staples Online or Amazon Online or this book vendor online, and they would they prefer credit card to anything else. Okay. Yeah, and finally, can you can you issue one of these cards to each of the department heads for eighty five to ninety percent of their line item budget amount and tell them that once they hit it, they're SOL. Yes, we can. We absolutely can. Okay. I just Thanks. want to comment that, oh, sorry. Okay. So as somebody that uses the system every day, because that's what the state uses, yeah. um, what is, what, where are you going to draw your line as far as your daily, like I see up here, you got $1,000 daily limit. 
or per purchase limit and ten thousand dollar per month. Um, is that going to be for? Are you going to bring it down to like per department? I mean, I I know mine. Like for my, I use my job as an example. My line budget is five thousand dollars per day yeah. as a pest control specialist. Yeah. I never ever touch that. Yeah. It's like it would never make sense for me to get five thousand dollars a day. So rather than use those large, you know, such a large number, wouldn't you think that if we did it, and since you can control it, wouldn't it make sense if like let's say the gym had a lower limit than say the English teacher that's buying books like I, I would I would work with department heads and we would actually personalize each limit so I'm thinking like you're speaking the gentleman that does our HVAC mm -hmm. he may need a five thousand dollar limit because he may need a part that's five thousand right. dollars he may need a ten thousand dollar limit on his card so that he can buy two of those parts over 60 days mm -hmm. whereas I might not need that because I don't have that type of buying pattern. So that's what I was wondering is that because you're going to do that kind of disorder. But, but then Paul, who's our lead custodian at the high school, he may only have a thousand dollar limit on his card because he doesn't, he goes to the hardware store and buys a $50 piece of, you know, something. Right. You know, he doesn't have the buying pattern or need that somebody else would. So we would look at each individual that we plan on giving one to mm -hmm. and customize their limit around their buying patterns and the level of authority we're comfortable giving. And then I guess the second question will be, are we gonna have like the state, there's certain vendors that are like, hey, shop with us, we'll give you a discount because you're buying this this much stuff. And it really comes back to the key card thing. Yeah. Like they're gonna look and see that, hey, we went into Ace, we'll choose Ace Hardware, it's right here in town. Yeah. Ace Hardware, and we bought $10,000 worth of stuff on the key card over the year. We're going to give you a 10% discount on everything. And they, you know, that's just so they're a preferred um, purchaser, I guess, or, or vendor because they're willing to do that. And they're knowing that every purchase is going to be paid with a P card because there's no, no need to do invoicing or any of that anymore. Right. So is that an avenue we're also going to work for? Because that will also save. It, it is. Money. And, and like you working for the state, uh, we, are able to use the state purchasing power in any state contract, we can hop right in on those state contracts and get those prices too. So with Swish or some of the other companies that we buy cleaning stuff with, we're already getting those contract prices. We can then put it on the P card and just clean up, clean that up. And they get paid right up front. They don't have to worry about anything. Exactly. So That's... it helps us streamline a lot of the things we do. I see Matt had his hand up, but also other people have questions. Yeah, sorry, just, quick question. Oh, go ahead, Matt. Um, just quickly, it sounds like a great system and could save us a lot of money. Um, but I do wonder if if you'll still have the same ability to approve certain types of spending that maybe you wouldn't want someone just uh you know purchases you wouldn't want someone making. Or, are you gonna still have a way to like pre-approve certain purchases and and then my second question is is it going to make it so easy to spend money that we'll end up spending more than we should um what i what i've done is a structure in the past where i have what i call the field purchase order where somebody like our hvac guy who's going out to buy something um goes out finds the price it's a 1500 dollars part he calls his uh, supervisor, Joe, and says, hey, Joe, I need this part. I'd like to buy my purchase order. Joe gives him a verbal. He writes right on his field purchase order approved by Joe, such and such, on the phone, and then it goes forward. And so we would still need a structure. It would take us away some from the purchase order structure that we have now, but without a structure, you're right, it turns into chaos. And so there needs to be a structure within each building, and I will work on a structure that is uh, compatible with uh, our administrators in our buildings. Jim, you mentioned uh, the company sends out kind of an agreement that individual cardholders need to sign in terms of the- we, we do. We do. We do. Okay. And so what it really is, is a responsibility and it, it lays out, you know, safety, it lays out, um, that they'll lose their card if they don't 
lose access to the yeah. credit, they don't turn in their receipts, and you know that they still need permission before they use it. Yeah, I guess where I'm going with that is, do we need a you know a policy or procedure document to be adopted in order to you know uh, maybe it doesn't need to rise to the level of a policy or I'll, I'll, I'll bring one to Elliot's group. Yeah, <laughs> I've, 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 I've got a sample. Sure. So, for example, that's what that's what the states look like. Hmm. Yep. Did so you? Want to... Does it? I was just curious if it gets into the realm of like um, potentially affecting credit of individual users. Is there any meshing there, or no? Because it's a district card, essentially. Except that your name is on it. There's no that's affiliation the between you and it. It is our credit. It is our. You are just the person signing. Got it. So to question, well, question in the comments. So you said there was a dashboard. Is there someone sort of looking at a dashboard to see if something's really a little bit out of whack or something that doesn't and now rather than wait for the statement to come at the end of it? So so Julie, who's our accounts payable person, who will have some time if we take away other work from her, will be shifting her some of her work to okay. monitoring the dashboard regularly. And I'm not going to tell you every day, but regularly. And it, you know at least a couple times a week yeah so my comment is that you know maybe it was prescient to say this is 24th century because it is called picard for those people who start <laughs> drinking <laughs> <friends. laughs> see i'm just getting confused between p card and restroom pass that's, that's my <laughs> it's all me sorry <laughs> are you going to also be doing receipt Coding, because yeah. that's what that, I mean. That's just what the state does to yeah. to cover like all these questions everybody else has been having. For example, I make a purchase. I have to code it underneath whatever code I use it for underneath my division. So, for example, if I'm buying a, I'm buying pesticides. Let's say I'm using spray. There's a certain code for wasp spray. There's a different code for ants. A different code for spiders. It's been broken down to that. I have to break that down, put it on the receipt. That's the six number, digit number. It's really easy, and then it comes when it gets sent to. Whoever the accountant is, they look at your purchase amount, look at what you have, what you receive, and go, oh. But is that audited? I mean, is someone going to put down that they purchased for this and it's really nothing to do with that and they just happen to put? But then that's why you send the receipt it because they'll show you the yeah, purchase. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 it gets on it. Yeah. It will still go through several soft gaps before it gets paid. Yes. Yeah. And, and if somebody codes it wrong, you know, a phone call will be made and say, hey, why did you code this X, Y, Z? And you've probably had that experience. You put the wrong code on it for some reason. Why did you code this? Oh, geez, I, I made a mistake. It should have been this. And life is good. Or no, it's this for this reason. Cool. It sounds complicated, but it's really, really easy. When, when people get the hang of it, it's really easy. And um, Calista's been working on this. And um, she... Calista, who is very old school, is very excited about this. So to me, that that was really encouraging. So we need to vote we to need to make a yes. We need to to approve the resolution, correct, Jim? Yes. So um, I think probably it's important for somebody to read that. If somebody would like to read that, the whole thing. Well, yeah. I'm happy this to. It's a big shift here. Sure. Let me let me let me read it out. Um, should I do it in the form of a motion? It's a resolution, I believe. I'd like to make a motion. Yes. Good. So I'll move to pass the following resolution. Resolution authorizing issuance of individual procurement cards, whereas the board of directors of the Mountain View School District and the Mountain View Supervisor Union has the authority to enter into an agreement with the Bank of Montreal for purchasing cards and now therefore be it resolved by the board of directors of the Mountain View School District and the Mountain View Supervisor Union. That the district treasurer and the board chairperson are authorized to enter into an agreement with the Bank of Montreal to secure procurement cards for each authorized employee of the school district and supervisory union under the such terms and conditions as approved by the board. Board authorizes the district's director of finance and operations to execute a P card program agreement on its behalf. Okay. Second. Thank you. <laughs> Any further questions before we vote? All in favor of approving the P-card resolution, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, I think that I have to fill out there's 14 people here, right? Okay. And zero nays. No. All right, well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jim, for thank you. bringing this forward. Cool. Okay. Um, so 
We now have some updates on the work of committees and working groups, starting with the Finance Committee. Finance did not meet over the summer. We took a, took a break. Very nice. <laughs> okay. Policy Committee. Did so, you ever rest? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we have uh, two, um, two policies for adoption. One is the uh, C21 search and seizure which again, uh, we, we've already brought it up twice. This is for adoption. It's to delineate the right of the schools to search its own and student properties under different circumstances. And just a reminder that part of the procedure is that the policy needs to go into handbooks. So um, I would like to ask for a motion for adoption for this. We've discussed it you now two times in the past. Are we ready to vote on that? We need a motion. We need a motion. Yeah. So moved. Second. Second. All right, by John. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay, it passes. Okay. Thank you, Elliot. Sure. The second one is actually I'm calling a friendly amendment. It is the equity, inclusion, diversity, and education, which we looked at a few times uh, over the last year, but this one is just to add um, national origin into it. Um, and there was one other grammatical thing that we took out. So if you wanted to look at the markup draft, we put it in, I believe, two paragraphs that it was appropriate. I looked at it. Yeah, and it was recommended, I think, by a group that Raph was meeting with that they just wanted to add that. So I'm calling it a, uh, a friendly amendment and trying to um, sort of uh, short circuit it and put it into adoption rather than going through the second and uh, first and second readings. But that's what I'm asking for, but. Okay, I, I did see it was just eliminating one word that was not- I think the word time, yes, that was one word eliminated and we were um, just putting the word national origin in appropriately. Do we want to check procedure with Raina? We can amend policy without Three readings. This is our yeah. Yeah, that's, that's it's already my adopted. question as well. Brina, can we do a friendly amendment like that? I think mm -hmm. so because the policy already existed and had been adopted, and this is just making slight changes that don't change the content or the intent of the policy. All right. So, uh, do we have to vote on a friendly amendment? Yeah, I think so. Probably. Corinne has her hand. All right, Corinne? I was just going to, yeah, try to move it forward. <clears throat> Should I move to accept the friendly amendment to this policy? Yes. The EID. You need a second? Second. Okay, Lara has seconded it. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Um, now for a second reading, uh, our policy on teaching and learning, again, trying to codify uh, priorities in alignment with our Fort River graduate strategic goals, um, and for obvious reasons, helps to uh, attract educators and for other reasons. So this is um, this would be the second reading. So the motion would be to. Um, Accept it for a second reading and um, send it to the board for next time for uh, adoption. That would be my request. So moved. Need a second? Second. Second for Marianne. All right. Um, is there any discussion on the policy? Okay. All in favor of moving it to adoption at the next meeting, please say aye. Uh, any opposed? All right. Okay. So for first reading, this is something that um, was sent to us over the summer. There are two sort of companion policies. One is F3, where, I, well, there's a letter, which I don't know if I have it here, but I will. Uh, there's a letter from the state saying that we need to have these two policies ASAP, actually by August. But um, this is as far as we're going to be able to get. So the F3 is just the 
um, emergency preparedness that we have delineated um, when we are having our drills, we're having them twice a, uh, a year. And that one is ready to go, there's a markup and a clean draft. And um, I would say that uh, that would be, this would be a motion for the second meeting in September. I think that's as quickly as we can push this in. Okay, I, I, I just I, want to mention that there is a companion for it, which has to do with access and control and visitor management, and we sent it to our legal team as it is, and it, it's a little more complicated, and we're going to have to work on it at our next policy meeting, so we're not ready to present that as uh, as for a first, um, for first reading. Okay. If, so it's just the F3 one that we're asking for. Did folks have a chance to look at it and have any questions about that? Okay, so can we have a motion to send that to a second reading? So moved. Thank you, John. Second. Thank you, Ryan. Okay, um, all in favor of sending it forward for a second reading, please say aye. 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 Okay, great. Okay, that's it for now. All right, thank you. <laughs> you guys are always... All right, buildings and grounds. Is there somebody who has an update from buildings and grounds? Uh, we did not meet as a committee after the last board meeting. We're meeting on August 21st. If Joe's in the room and wants to give any updates, I know there's a lot going on after the, the fields were flooded, but I can't see from here if Joe is actually there tonight. He, he is not here. Joe's today. not, but he did give me a couple highlights if, if you yep. want. Um, our lower fields have flooded twice. Um, we had water on them again over the weekend, but not flooding. Uh, we have silt on the fields that as soon as it dries enough, we can get equipment on there. We will remove it. We will oversee the fields, and the fields will generally be fine. Um, we have lost three of our practice fields for the fall season. Uh, we will lay out a practice field on the softball field, so we will be able to gain use of a different area for practice. And we're in the process of setting up two practice fields out across the valley. So our teams will have adequate surfaces to practice and to play. There will be a little sharing. There'll be a little scheduling. Uh, there'll be some challenges, but um, all of our playing surfaces for for games are all fine. And um, Joe and his team are working really hard to make sure that we have adequate fields for all of the activities. As far as summer projects, in spite of the rain, the roof at Killington is dressing. Um, it's behind schedule. Um, but we've had zero water damage in that building because of all the rain. So they've been just doing an amazing job. Um, a couple of the insulation projects that were part of this will not get done this summer and we'll bring them back in during um, different holidays and have them do the spray insulation because there just isn't enough time in the calendar to get it done before the kids come back in the fall. Um, the heating system, there's a box of valves over there that uh, came in today we've been waiting for. So those will get plumbed in the next week or so. And that product, that, that um, system is moving forward. They'll be out of the classrooms before the kids come back. They may still have some work in the hallways and the boiler room to finish, but we'll have heat in the building by the end of September. So uh, those projects are going very well. It's considering uh, the road up to say that. All right. Well, it sure has been challenging for builders uh, yeah. and people who live in the floodplains. Terrible. Um, okay. Uh, negotiations, negotiations, hiring, and retention has no report. Uh, we will start in the first early to work on the negotiations with the uh, teachers, teaching staff. I know that Linda is working on the job um, descriptions. Um, any working group updates? Yeah, uh, New Build has been incredibly busy since the last uh, board meeting. Uh, Lee came in um, and kind of divided the working group into four 
little um, sub stream I think I probably gave that update in uh, June. But those uh, little uh, teams uh, had a series of meetings, probably about a dozen of them in uh, in June. And then we had another uh, joint meeting uh, last week. And it was interesting. Um, Jim, are you able to give me uh, the sharing rights or is that, is that doable? Um, the, um, I, I wanted to just share with the, the board um, some uh, the HVAC options for the new building that came back from the engineering team because they're, they're pretty interesting. Go for them. Yeah, thanks. Um, one of the, oh, I guess I need to get on the Zoom. Well, see, do you have the, the, the presentation that, that uh, um, yeah. Eric uh, Gavin provided? Okay. Yeah, I'll just speak to it while you pull that up. Um, so yeah, this is interesting because the, the feedback that, that came out of the sustainability group um, and the entire working group was really, you know, the it, it's about net zero, right? Being able to lean into this. Um, sustainability is incredibly important. We looked at, you know, considered some previous options that included fossil fuels uh, in, you know, like a, a summer ago, we were thinking about maybe like a pellet burner or something like that. And now, you know, the direction that the working group has given to the engineers is to say, no, we want, you know, all electrical systems. So if you go down to the, I guess you know, yeah, no worries. <laughs> um, the last slide here gives the financials for these systems. And what's interesting, I wanted to share with the board is until, very recently, if you wanted to go all electrical or geothermal, that was very expensive. And it's still an expensive thing to do up front, but over the life of a building and what the engineers have calculated for us is the 40 year life of the new building, it is incredibly cheaper than fossil fuels to go with these electrical options. So once you get that shared, I wanted to, to um, put up the financials on the, um, on the last slide. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at something. Obviously, I'm not sure I know where you're Oh, yeah. Try it again. Where do we get our electricity from? Uh, it, interesting. The uh, so the much of it is everybody but us is seeing the right screen. Then okay. Oh, everybody but us. Huh? Well, that's funny. There's some people in the room aren't seeing it. What, what's on the screen? Yeah, I can see it. Right, the Zoom folks can see it, I guess. Huh. I have a copy of it. But... Yeah, I'm, I see it. I'm looking at it. Can we share? Um, folks on the oh, folks on the Zoom can see. But I guess the thing I wanted to point out is that um, there's an option that's all geothermal um, that's got uh, some. Uh, air handling units uh, associated with it. It's the cheapest option over the 40 year life of the thing. And it's $22 million cheaper than our current uh, heating systems in the building burning fossil fuels, which is pretty crazy. It's $33 million uh, over a 40 year span. That includes the initial, you know, costs um, versus you know, what it would take to, um, you know, burn fossil fuels. There it is, uh, there it is, that first column, the existing, because you know that those systems that we've got would need to get replaced. You're probably in you know Thank you. ten years or so anyway. So there's going to be costs associated with that, and then the fuel itself is, is fifty five million, and then you got your your geothermal there that one B, and that's um, the option that most of the uh, the working group, the sustainability and the facilities streams got the most excited about, and we communicated back to the architects to use for operational purposes. So it's kind of an exciting time to be building a building because we've got some things that are out there that are you know cheaper than what we have now. And that's not just cheaper, but you know we can eliminate a couple million pounds of carbon dioxide getting you know kicked into the atmosphere while we're at it. So and that's going to be so the electrical you know um, to support that is solar panels on the roof, solar panels in the uh, the side parking lot, not the main parking lot, and then we're looking at. Probably about an eight acre offsite solar array uh, in order to provide enough power for the, for the facility. How will that work over the course of the year between like the dark months of what, November, December? Will we? Yep. And that's what makes it net zero. It's not, that's okay. not, um, you'll, you'll take all your power from uh, those solar panels. It's just that in the summertime when they're cranking it, you know, full throttle and they're plugging power back into the grid. Then the uh, on balance you give more than you take from the unless it was this summer. 
<laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but that's the idea. But uh, yeah, it's a kind of an interaction with the you're you're hooked up to you know the electrical grid, but you're just pumping into it uh, more than you take out. So do, does the do we sell the electricity back in the summer? Do they do they pay us? For there's, there's, there's different. Yeah, there's, there's different the meter parts. essentially runs backwards. Yeah, yeah. and then. Can we reinstitute hydroelectric power? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> what option? I don't want to take too much uh, time for the board. It's just a quick update from the working group. We'll certainly have something more, uh, you know, comprehensive as we go through, uh, you know, down the stretch here. But I just wanted to let everybody know. So it's the upfront money. A lot more. So yeah, you can see that first the, cost. The, the key information on this is the first cost. Yeah. Um, ranging anywhere from just shy of fifteen million. For the most expensive, which is all geothermal, to 10 million, which is the air to air systems. Okay. And we're leaning towards the column B, which is 14.2. A um, couple of important things to look at is the PEUI range, the first row. And I forget what PEUI is, but it's a measure of the amount of electricity we need to run the system and the lower the number, the better it is. Those are, that's the key thing to take from that. So A and B under the all geothermal are use the least power. And then that's again, supported by the last row that says the square footage of uh, photovolastic, elastic, volatile, voltaic, voltaic, there we go. Cells that you need for all geo A is just under one, um, meg and just over one meg for B. And then the other key things were uh, life cycle replacement costs over 40 years, all in, you're looking at 33 to 35 million versus 55 million for what we currently have, and 44 million for the all air to air system on the far away. So those were the key things as a number guy that I. Uh, I was drawn to. So, do we have models for these being used for 40 years? I mean, where are they? Haven't been available for 40 years. But geothermal's been around. Geothermal's been around. That's what I mean. And the geothermal we're looking at is a water system. So, there's no chemicals in it, unlike the air to air system, which uses a refrigerant. And so, it's an old fashioned type of water system. That uses geothermal. I guess I know Marshmallow's Rockefeller, the yeah. National Park. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting things is, you know, and the question we, we gave, um, we asked some pretty tough questions to the engineers, I think, because one of the things this assumes is 40 year lifespan. And they say, well, your geothermal system equipment is going to last that long, whereas these other, you know, refrigerant systems will need to be replaced in 15 or 20 years. The question we asked is, well, what if it goes 50 years and then we have to replace these geothermal systems? Won't that be expensive? And the answer was no, because your cost is in digging the holes, the the the, the wells and so on. And we're going to be um, digging a, a test well here in a couple of weeks. Um, it'll be right between the parking lot and the field here to see just how many wells we need. And engineers think it'll be somewhere between 150 and 200. Okay. So, my I've talked to a lot of people about the geothermal thing. A lot of my the one thing I keep hearing is if 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 it has something going on with it. Be prepared because it's going to be expensive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just kind of look at that number going, okay, so we're saying 40 years, but let's be realistic and think about it as 20, like we would everything else. Mm -hmm. and, you know, apples to apples, because if, if it fails, I've heard it's really, really expensive to find some way to come fix it. And it's not like a quick fix either. Mm -hmm. Usually it's not like, oh, the boiler went down, let's go get a new nozzle, put the nozzle in. Mm -hmm. Your boiler's running. Yeah. So I'm just trying to, you know, kind of. No, it's interesting because yeah. it feels like a variation on the question. Now, I mean, from a cost standpoint, now your uh, convenience, like the availability of, of resources, you can say the reason that we went with B versus A was ease of maintenance. And you can see that show up in the maintenance cost that you got the $4 million mm -hmm. in, in that column 1A um, kind of pops out, whereas it's the, the air handler units are, um, Joe was, was really urging everybody to, to go with B versus A because of the ease of maintenance. Because A gave each room an individual, individually controlled unit, mm -hmm. where B is a more standardized system like what we have here for the air handling. Right. So I know I was just one of those things that like I said, I was just looking at the talking to people in the industry and their one concern with geothermal solely as the sole 
thing, not like a hybrid, is that if it fails for whatever reason, mm -hmm. it's really hard to fix and it's not going to be fixed. Well, isn't that what so, the chart is disagreeing with, though, is maintenance? No, we're saying that it's a what if, is what I'm saying. Yeah, that are, what if, it's if the, you're thinking about like maybe residential versus, you know, this um, building where we're going to have a full time maintenance team, you know, that the, the, going to be trained on the and, equipment. And so, if, if, no. if a wheel, a well or two goes down, you can isolate them and repair them. Um, but if a pump goes down, it may be pumping 25 well, uh, wells. You've got to have availability of parts and service. And, and you're right. So there's, and it's not as common, obviously, right. as oil propane burners. I think it's probably going that way. So it's, 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 it's a growing it's system. Place, yeah. Anyway, I didn't want to take uh, everybody's time tonight. We're trying to get out of here pretty quickly, but uh, I did want to give a shout out to Bob Green. Uh, the architects also came back with a revised floor plan based on some uh, feedback from the education uh, group. And it's, it was great. They incorporate a lot of changes, but uh, Bob just made this very straightforward suggestion about uh, rotating the orientation of the parking lot and the landscapers were like, yeah, that makes a lot more sense. Let's do that. So it was uh, pretty, pretty cool to see that show up in the design. So Ben, when do you expect the, the communities to be getting um, forums or informational sessions. Yeah, working on uh, communications plan with Marlena and the uh, comms group. That's another one of our little work streams. And uh, we should be have, have have a plan at least to, uh, put together here in the next couple of weeks oh, uh, to be able to start rolling the message out. Great. I mean, the big thing I'm just going to ask is how much does the project cost, right? And I think the, the tax impact, um, you know, right. policy, the cap that we've set as a board should be very meaningful. We need to convince people that, you know, we have the means to make good on that cap and fundraising will help that. Some of the things that we're doing with the USDA, hopefully will will help us make good on that. But, um, you know, until we get the final costing, you know, people are going to have that question. Mm -hmm. but that, that's it for the working group update. All Where right. You doing? Um, any other working groups? Marianne, do you want to speak briefly about the portrait of a graduate, which is a sure. side group as well? Yeah, um, Ben was a part of that as well. It was really, we're in the super beginning stages of just redoing what our portrait of a graduate looks like currently, because it's at the end of the last year of what it is. So it's really nice to see it's a really big group. It's teachers, it's students, it's um, parents, it's a couple, two of us. Um, just a really great group of a lot of different perspectives, community partners. Um, so we're all having some like very candid, um, open discussions about a lot of issues that we're facing in our community in, in, in the world. And it's, I feel really hopeful about creating a new plan. Um, and we're talking about how that can be reflected on, you know, how kids are evaluated on that because we have some really specific things. Um, so we just talked a little bit about how does that trickle down? Like, what does that look like on a report card? Or what does that look like? How are we measuring what we're doing? Um, so we just only had one meeting so far and we'll have four more, I believe. Um, but it's just a really great group and it feels really positive. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Are we ready to approve the minutes from the previous meeting and, and is there a motion to approve them? I'll make the motion. <laughs> you can share the screen. Who, who made the motion? Uh, okay, Josh made the motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Marion seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 Very good. Thank you. Um, and we had another meeting on June 19th. So can we uh, approve um, a motion, please? Josh, would you like to make that motion? I was not here for that meeting, so I'll make a motion. Okay, Ryan made the motion. And who would like to second it? Second. Ben is seconding. All in favor of approving the minutes? Aye. 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 Thank you. All right, we have an opportunity for um, public comment if there are any members of the public who would like to speak. All right. Um, now we do need, we do not have an executive session tonight. Um, we are going to reflect now on our meeting the land speed record it is a speed record i think we should have pizza so to invite people to come in right. person if, 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 yeah see over here on the side uh, ryan kindly brought some pizza in for us that we will enjoy once no one's taking me up on it. closing the meeting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Unexpected. All right, well, I think we've got some good information tonight from various things that we've heard about through the community of concerning fields and uh, new builds and, and other things. So thank you all. Um, is there a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion to adjourn. Oh, you want that? Josh way. hasn't made the motion. Who's going to second it? Second. Okay, all in favor? Uh, aye. 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 That was a resounding aye. So we will end the meeting at 8.04.